Hi and welcome, my name is Lawrence Baker and this is going to be a beginner's guide to SEO. It's going to be a PowerPoint presentation. I know that's boring, but I need to cover a lot of topics and I don't want to miss anything out. So it will be about 30 minutes long. I will chapter it off in the description, but if you're not very patient, this video is really not for you because I'm going to cover everything I think is relevant for SEO. So let's get started. It's called search engine optimization for starters, but the terminology is quite important. So Googlebot is an internet bot, spider or web crawler that follows links on the internet, extracting content from web pages. Index, where Google puts the content it has extracted from web pages. Robots.txt or robots.txt, a file used to instruct search bots, mainly, what pages they can access. User intent, what a searcher is actually looking for. User intent is not always obvious. Some people just spray keywords into a search box. SERP, search engine result pages, where you want to be. HTML, hypertext markup language, two main parts, the head not seen on the page and the body mainly seen on the page. Title is stored in the head of a document and therefore not seen on the page. Meta description, a summary of a page for search engines stored in the head of a document, therefore not seen on the page. Structured data, a way of marking up data so that search engines can understand it better and present it better. Rich result, a search result that can convey more information in a richer way often relying on structured data. Backlink, incoming link from another domain. Anchor text, the readable text describing a link. So the HTML anatomy of a page, the basic building blocks are, they're the opening HTML tags and the closing HTML tag. We've got the head, we've got a title there and a meta description. Notice it's called meta name equals description content equals, but called the meta description. And that's the head done. The body, H1, you always must have a H1 for compliance with W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. There's a paragraph, that's the body, that's where the content goes, job done. The three pillars of SEO. These are my three pillars, I believe the most important things. Crawlability, can Google crawl your site? Usability, is your site user friendly? Content, can your web page meet user intent? So this is a quick overview of crawlability. Google Search Console is the best option and it's an app from Google. And if you've got your property or your site added to it, you're guaranteed to be crawled. Backlinks, if you've got backlinks from other domains, they're hard to get, but that's the way you could be found because the bot goes around following links. Build it and they will come. Yes, Google will find you eventually, but it's not the best option. Overview of usability. Do your web pages load fast? Do your web pages work on all devices, mobile phone and desktop, up to an 8K television, for instance? Is your site accessible to those with disabilities? Content, quick overview. Does your web page meet the user or answer user intent? Is your content original, unique and adding value? Is your web page title representative of the content and unique? Do you have a meta description that's original and describes the subject accurately? So let's deal with crawlability first, the, the, you know, the big one. Can Google find you? So site structure is very important. Make sure every page has internal links or a menu system. Make sure your site has a robust menu system and every page is reachable in under three clicks of a mouse. Very important that. If a page has no internal links and is not in the sitemap, Google will not find that page. And that's the same for any search bot like Bing or Yahoo, etc. Everything I say about Google applies to them as well. Have a sitemap. So sitemaps definitely help. Sitemaps tell Google the pages you want crawled on your site. They're written in XML, which is basically text, and I'll show you one in a minute. Sitemaps are not mandatory. Plugins like Yoast for WordPress create sitemaps for you. The larger your site, the more the need for sitemaps. Sitemaps normally reside in the root directory of a site. Here's a sitemap. It's my site. It's generated by Yoast. So if I had thousands and thousands of pages, that last modified column there would be really important because Google will come around and say, we don't need to crawl that page. 
It's not changed since the last time we've been here, so we're not going to crawl it again. And that's called crawl budget. And it's very important because Google don't want to overload your servers. So if you've got a sitemap, it's really helping Google not overload your server. So it's very important. You need Google Search Console. Without a doubt, you definitely need it. Google Search Console is a web app that gives you feedback about your site from a Google Search point of view. It guarantees you're going to be crawled by Google as well. Google Search Console is split into roughly five parts. Performance, which keywords were pretty obvious. Clicks, who's clicking, what people clicking on, so how many clicks have you got. Impressions is how many times your search result has been seen in the search engine result pages. Index is all about the coverage. Enhancements about mobile usability and structured data. Security, obviously, if you've got malware, it will tell you. And manual actions, have you been naughty, broken a rule, a quality guideline, you'll have a manual action against you. Links, incoming and outgoing. So it shows you all this. Here's a screenshot. So this is not interactive, so I'm just showing you what it actually looks like. It's extremely important. It's one of the best tools, and it's free. What is a canonical URL? I'm only mentioning this because it confuses a lot of people when they start reading about SEO. So I'm just going to explain what a canonical URL is. A canonical URL is your preferred version of a site. So it's what you want to be judged on. It's where you want people to go to. For instance, the www secure version has HTTPS and the www. The non www secure version just has HTTPS. The same for the non www or non www insecure version and the, the www insecure version. So yeah. That's what a canonical URL is. So you make that decision, basically. Now, a lot of this will be handled by your hosting provider, especially if you've got SSL, which is HTTPS. They will point the non-secure version at your secure version, and that's called a 301 redirect. You hear a lot about 301s, and they're redirects to the preferred version of your site, the canonical version. So don't want to dwell on it. I just needed to explain it. So a typical robots.txt file or text file, you can see right at the very top, it's got user agent. And with that star there, it says anything can crawl this site. So a user agent is a browser like Chrome or Opera or Edge for Microsoft, or it could be a bot. They're not stopping anything coming around. So this is Google's robots text, as you can see it there. So if you type up a URL or domain forward slash robots text, Dot text, you'll see the robots file. Mine's two lines long. This is huge. What it's allowing, what it's disallowing. Some bots will respect it, some won't. Google, Bing, and Yahoo definitely respect your robots.txt file. Sometimes, though, they have to crawl a page if uh, it's been pointed from somewhere else, from another site, and they think it's worth crawling it, they will. But most of the time, they respect it. Right, we're going to deal with usability in detail here. Usability is all about mobiles. Googlebot crawls sites as a smartphone. So not as a desktop, as a smartphone. Mobile usability is very important. Your site must work on all devices from the smallest phone to the largest desktop and probably an 8K television as well. What factors influence usability? Speed more than anything else. Do your web pages load fast? Are they responsive? And responsive means responsive to different devices. Do they work on all devices? Compatibility. Does your site work on all web browsers? Continuity. No separate domains for mobile devices. The reason being, let's say you've got an M dot version of your site, so mobile dot, M dot, and you're hiding information from mobile users that you show to people on a desktop. Google crawls your page as a smartphone. It picks the mobile domain version, which will not have that detail in it that you're showing to the desktop. So that detail will never show up in the index. So consequently, it won't show up in the search result pages as well. So it's really important you don't have a separate mobile version now to try and keep everything on one domain. Security. Do you have HTTPS, SSL, Secure Sockets layer? It is a ranking signal for search now. You definitely need it. Legibility. Is the text readable on all devices? Is it clickable? Are clickable elements easy to click? Are they too close together, et cetera, et cetera? Resolvable, are images easy to see on all devices? If it's too small for a mobile phone, it's no use to anyone. Accessibility, is your site usable for those with disabilities? 
What can you do to improve page loading speed? The number one thing is optimize your images to the smallest possible file size in bytes without reducing quality too much. Defer the loading of JavaScript. I know some of this you won't have control over, but I do need to mention it. Minify your CSS and HTML by removing white space. Combine your CSS files. Deploy web caching. Use a CDN, Content Delivery Network. My service in London, someone from Sydney accesses my page without a CDN. It has to go from my server down the wires to Sydney. That would be called a propagation delay. So what you do is you have sites around all around the world serving up cache versions of your page. So someone in Sydney can actually access my page from the server in Sydney. That's what a content delivery network is. You usually have to pay for them. Some big providers have their own kind of mini CDNs as well. So content delivery network is important if you want your web page to reach worldwide because it will make it much faster for people geographically not in the same location as your server. Use gzip compression. I know you won't be able to control this, but what happens is they zip up the files and send them over the wires and the browser unzips them basically. Make fewer HTTP requests. Again, I know you're not going to be able to do this yourself unless you're a web developer, but you need to understand what it takes to have a fast loading page. So not everything is under your control. The one main thing you have control over is your images. 80% of the data on the net or on the web is images. So essential optimization for images. There is no need for huge pixel dimensions. Keep the longest edge under 2000 pixels. Use the lowest JPEG quality setting for photos on export. If you don't use Photoshop or Lightroom, you might not know what I'm talking about. But if you do, it's very important to come out at a very low JPEG quality. I use 30. Use 8-bit for PNG files. So if you don't have a lot of complexity in a PNG file, not a lot of transparency, use 8-bit instead of 24-bit. So it keeps the file size small. This is very important and not understood by many people. Further compress your images using one of the many tools out there. Squoosh from Google is one of the best. So when you come out of, let's say, Photoshop at 30 quality, it's being compressed right down because JPEG's a lossy compression method. It's got rid of a lot of data, but the picture still looks reasonable. How can you take more data out of that file? The reason is that Adobe don't use very aggressive compression methods and nor do a lot of other image editing software. So there's always some data to be taken out. Now, Squoosh is an online app. So here on the left hand side is the original file. On the right hand side is the optimized file. I've resized it, I've picked Moz JPEG, etc., for the quality setting, and I've got it down to 596 kilobytes from 1.84. So 1.84 there, bottom left. Bottom right, I've got it 68% smaller. That's why you need to compress your images. Mobile usability matters most. Font size and contrast between type and background is important for those browsing with a small mobile phone. Don't use images as links unless you add a descriptive alt attribute. I'll cover the alt attribute later. So don't use images for important things to convey important information or as links unless you absolutely have to. And if you do use an image, give it an alt attribute to describe it. Don't make your user interact with your web page. Let's say you've got a modal, which is like an accordion you click on to access data. Google can read that now, but anything like that is not good for usability. And if you're using JavaScript to hide stuff, Google probably might be able to read it, but they'll see it as negative for usability. That could affect your search ranking as well. Don't hide stuff from Google or your users. It's not the best way of doing things. This is all about disabilities, so make sure your text is legible. Do not put clickable elements too close together. And add alt attributes to images to describe the image for screen readers for the visually impaired. We're going to come to that in a minute. So content is king, absolutely. Content is the number one thing that drives search clicks. Let's say you've got a site, it's got a few usability problems, you're not that fast, but your content is good. Well, you'll still be shown in the search engine result pages. If your usability is absolutely fantastic, but your content is crap, then you won't show up in the search engine result pages. Content should be written with the end user in mind, not the search engine. 
Don't flood your stuff with keywords. You know, make it your original, unique, and make it add value. Your content has to be better than your competitors. Content has to contain keywords. That's important that are related to the search, but do not flood your copy unnaturally with those keywords. If you have expertise in your chosen subject, you will write using keywords naturally. Now, a lot of SEO people will disagree with what I'm saying here. There's some common myths about SEO. I listen to Google. I don't listen to anyone else when I sort of read or listen to SEO. So keyword research is often given as being essential. It isn't now. If you know your subject, you will write with authority. But if you don't and you're a copywriter, maybe keyword research is for you. But it doesn't mean it's essential for everyone. Keyword density is important. It isn't. It's really out of fashion that now. Google have natural language processing using AI and machine learning, etc. And they understand language very well. You don't need to flood your work with keywords. It's not a deaf elderly relative. That's how some people treat Google. They just keep repeating things. Google is very clever. It understands. Google cares about your document outline. It doesn't care for search because content is content. So if you've got your H1 in the wrong place or H2 in the wrong place, Google won't care. They care about the content. But for usability, it's not a good thing. You need to optimize for very specific low competition key phrases. Let's say you're in a very competitive market. You're selling trainers, let's say, and you're up against you know, the big boys. Then people say, well, you should go out and find these very low competition key phrases that people hardly use and you're guaranteed to show up for them. I think it's very old fashioned now. We have natural nat language processing. So if you want to do that, by all means do it. But I don't think it's that important now in 2020. Your meta description is very important. It isn't. It's not a search ranking signal. It can be used as the search snippet, but it's not very important. Plenty of sites are showing up on the first page of Google that don't have a meta description. You need to spend $99 a month for an SEO tool like Moz or SEM Rush. Unless you're an SEO expert, I don't recommend that because some of their tools are so esoteric as to be pointless for the average person. So you don't need to spend that money. Another one is another myth is you will go to number one spot on Google straight away. And that's a myth I had. I thought, well, I've, I've written some good content here. What happens with Google? It's not their computing power. They need to get feedback from users. So if you get shown on the first page and it's the first time you've been there and someone searches for a search term, you're there, they click on it, go to your web page. It's not what they want. They come back to Google straight away. That's a negative ranking signal. So then your, your listing will be pushed down the search engine result pages for that search term because people don't want to read it. So they need to gather this information and understand what's going on. And you know, for you to knock people off their perch, you've got to have really good content and it's not going to happen straight away. They, they need to get a feel for your site. I think it's a deliberate sort of ploy with their algorithms that they're not going to let you just jump to the very top well, most of the time straight away. Domain authority is important. It's made up by Moz and most of them use it now like SEM Rush. It's saying how authoritative is your site. So if you get a link from a high domain authority site, it carries more link juice, as they say. I don't think it's important. Google definitely don't think it's important. They care about the content. You know, if the US government is linking to you, yeah, well, that's pretty good. And it probably will give you some um, you know, search ranking signal. I mean, it'll be positive. But I'm saying is it's not something that Google recognize. And I personally think it's a waste of time. But if you're interested in that type of thing, obviously my site, I've got very low domain authority, but US government's got very high domain authority. That's how it works, basically. But I personally don't rate it very much. Backlinks are very important. They're important. They're not very important. They're often abused. People buy them. Google know this. It's very, very spammy to buy links. And Google usually will find you out, basically. So backlinks are important, but are not as important as they were. URLs should contain keywords. Officially, Google say this. It's very insignificant. It's a slight significance from having keywords in the URL. Your user might like it because keywords are in the URL. But honestly, it's so insignificant that it's not worth bothering about. So the title of the page is in the head of the document, not seen on the page. It shows as a tab header or a bookmark name. The title is important and must be unique and descriptive of your page, especially if Google use it. Google might, I repeat, might 
use your title as the title in the search listing. Ideally, a title should not be longer than 60 characters to avoid truncation in the search engine result page. So the meta description also in the head, not seen on the page, is a written summary of your page for search engines. The meta description should ideally be under 160 characters to avoid truncation in the search engine result pages. It's not a search ranking signal at all. Google might, I repeat might, use your meta description as a search snippet. So here's uh, what they call a plain blue search result. So number one is the breadcrumb there, and that's what it's called. Number two is the title. It could be your title. It might be created by Google using your text. Number three is the search snippet. It might be your meta description. Equally, Google can create it using your text. Why would Google not use the title and meta description? Because your title or meta description, or both, don't match the search query. In this scenario, Google will use your copy to construct your title or your meta description, or both. Bottom line, make sure your title and meta description accurately describe the content of your page. You can't cover all bases, but try your best. Don't forget, Google does what it likes on its own site. Structured data. Structured data is a method of marking up data to make it more meaningful to search engines so that they can present that data in a structured way. An ideal example would be a food recipe, an event, or a book review. This is a rich result. It's like a carousel. It's been driven by structured data on the BBC site here. So you can see how structured data gets used. A few points about structured data. Schema.org is the normal method you use for classifying your data. So you have a type, like a book review or a recipe, and you have properties like the title, etc. JSONLD, JavaScript object notation for linked data is the normal method for wrapping up your data. So you mark it up with schema.org and you wrap it in JSONLD. Google does not have to use your structured data to present information. It can do it programmatically, but it does help. Using structured data does increase your chances of being shown in rich results. Well, here's a typical markup here. So you can see the title and then the context is HTTPS schema.org. The type is an event, the name, ventures of X, start date, end date, location, etc. place. So that's an example of structured markup. Document outline. It's not a signal for search, but it's very important for usability. In, in fact, I don't know how much ranking they give it for usability, but I think it's very important. Your reader does like to read well-structured data, so use it correctly. Try and use lists where possible as they help Google present data and it helps the user as well. Try to use a summary of your whole page or just for sections. That helps the reader and helps Google as well. Try to use uh, content links at the top of your page so that users can go to relevant sections quickly. So readability, use short paragraphs. Very important, no one likes long paragraphs on the web. Use some form of spell and grammar checker. I use WordPress, I use Grammarly. It's the free version and it's very good. Write naturally, if you understand the topic, you don't need to spray your copy with keywords. As I said, read pages that are ranking on the first page of Google for your chosen search term. What bells and whistles are they adding to make their copy good for search engines? Don't copy them, the content, copy what they're doing. If they're using lists and summaries and it's got them to number one, you use lists and summaries. Links, use internal linking. If someone's on a page and you think you've got another page that might help them, link to it. It's good to help Google understand your site so they know the relationship between pages. Use external linking. Don't be selfish. Help your reader. I think Google see it as a good thing. They don't say whether they do or don't. But I think personally, if you're helping your reader, then it's a good thing. Make your anchor text descriptive. Don't just use the word link or click here. Affiliate links should be marked up with sponsored or no follow so that Google will not follow those links. Apparently that's changing. They might follow them, but they won't attribute any search signals from those links. Backlinks from other domains are important. As I said, you know, really important in SEO, but they're not massively important as they were. But try and get backlinks. They're very hard to get. Don't buy them. You'll get a manual action. They will find you out eventually. Don't go in for our link to you if you link to me. Especially if your sites are not related in any way at all, what's the point of that? What purpose are you serving? So some examples of links here. Here's an affiliate link. You can see REL sponsored there. A good descriptive anchor text, do you want to learn SEO? 
instead of just click here. Please don't take this link into account for search ranking purposes. That's no follow. You can use that for affiliate links as well. It is changing a little bit. I think what Google is saying is we still might follow the link, but we won't attribute any ranking signal to it. I think that's changing at the moment, actually. Links in user comments on forum, for instance, user generated comments, UGC, because often people go and put comments in so they can get people to go to their site so you can mark them up with UGC. Time wasters, as I call them. Adding information to images, very important this. Although Google can understand the contents of an image, Google probably does not understand the context yet. You need to surround your images with as much information as possible. An image has got to enhance the information it surrounds. If the image is purely for decoration, leave it alone. But for every other image, you need to tell Google what the image is all about. So if it's not for decoration, you need to add stuff to that image to you know, make sure that Google understands it. So how do you add that information to images? We use the alt attribute. So here, there's the image source kitten.jpg alt kitten playing with a ball of wool. Make the file name describe the image, not just for example, image 001.jpg, use a dash to break up the word. So picture of a kitten playing with a ball of wool.jpg, alt picture of, etc. Use figure and fig caption if you want to caption underneath. Um, so you have to wrap it in figure, the image, then use fig caption, kitten playing with a ball of wool, and end it with a slash figure. So that's how you add information to images. Eat, EAT, expertise, authority and trust. Now, much is made of eat by many SEO experts. It's actually not decided by an algorithm, it's decided by a human reviewer. And people have picked up on it, and I personally believe for most of us it's not important, but it's for sites that can affect your money or your life. So if you're promoting a health product or a financial product, Google will look at you very carefully. And what will happen is you'll be sent to a, a manual reviewer and you'll look at your site and say, I think these people are promoting something which is dangerous to health or it could take people's money away. They're not registered with the financial authority or whatever. So they're called your money or your life sites. And that's what Google call them. Google quite likely are not going to promote a site that's selling a dangerous health product or an implausible financial product. So, so unless your site falls within that remit of your money and your life, I don't think you need to worry about it. The trouble is, expertise, authority and trust has been taken by SEO experts to apply to every site. There's, it's true that some of the algorithms will assess expertise, authority and trust, but it's there for manual reviewers of sites that match your money or your life criteria. So don't worry too much about it. Don't be stupid. This is how I approached SEO years ago. I flooded my text with keywords. We know that's wrong. I kept incessantly checking Google search. I was constantly changing my content for the wrong reasons by changing the keywords, over-optimizing my pages by adding the keyword too many times to my pictures, my headings, etc. And I got impatient. I believed things would happen overnight. In fact, once I got quite clever, when I started to understand it, I'm not saying I'm quite clever, when I got to understand everything, I just sort of got my text settled, left it three months later for my given search term, I was on the front page. I went from the sixth page to the front page. So it worked. So don't panic if don't, things don't happen overnight. This is from Google itself. I've just copied this. So quickly, these are the things that were breached their quality guidelines. Generated content, automatically generated. Participating in link schemes, buying links. Creating pages with little or no original content. That's what they call thin content. Cloaking, hiding stuff from people, basically. Stinky redirects, you go to a page and you end up somewhere else. We've all been there. Hidden text or links, making the text the same color as the background. Doorway pages that lead somewhere else. Scrape content, copy content. Participating in affiliate programs without adding sufficient value. That's called a thin page where you don't really mention the product that much and just have a link. Loading pages with irrelevant keywords. Creating pages with malicious behavior, you know, phishing, etc. Abusing structured data markup. Marking up something that's not a recipe and marking it up as an event or something. So it shows up in rich results. They'll catch you for that straight away. Don't bother with that. Sending automated queries to Google. That's it, guys. That's the end of the slideshow. I hope you got something from this. I don't mind being asked questions. Some people might disagree with what I've said. There's a lot goes on in the SEO world. A lot of people claim to be experts. And what I would say is listen to Google first. Go and read their guidelines. They're easily available. Listen to their YouTube videos. Read their blog. You will get a good feel of what SEO is all about. 
Some people don't believe Google. Why they don't, I don't know. But they think Google are hiding things from them. And they say things like, don't do as Google say, just do, do as they act, so to speak. But it's not true. I hope you got something from this. Thank you very much.